And the other thing was the 1982 Vet Clinics of North America, which was quite something um, as a text. And, you know, the Vet Clinics series are series of, of articles that are, you know, you get together the experts in the area to all write different articles. But this, that, and with the um, compendium articles, um, you co-author a lot of it with Peter Borschelt, who um, was another pioneer, and we'll perhaps um, talk a little bit about that about him um, later on. But in the vet clinics, you're authoring about nine of the chapters. And I presume that's because there just weren't the other people out there then. Yeah, we, we, we both wrote most of those and actually helped the other people right there. So uh, yeah, there really were very few people doing the, this, engaged in this work at that time. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, as I said, to me, and I, I said sort of in the introduction, if you use things like desensitization, counter conditioning, it's actually your work that, that seems to be the sort of amongst the first to document its use. Um, there's some stuff by David Tuber, and again, perhaps later on we'll get to chat about David, um, somebody I knew personally, but I know that you knew him very well. Um, but you know, you were really the person who kicked off a lot of these um, sort of fundamental methods. So how did you how did you come about? How did you come into this field in the beginning? Well, um, it sort of started at Ohio State University and I was halfway through veterinary school and I read a book called Territorial Imperative by Robert Ardre and it was a, a popular book. And I remember reading it and, and not being so much fascinated about the parallels he was making between people and animals but the stories about the animals that he was telling, the ethology stories and the field work. And I had, I had no idea that this existed as something people could do, which is actually study the behavior of animals, oh. uh, if particularly in the field or their natural behaviors. And I thought it was fascinating. So immediately upon graduating from vet school, I went on to get a master's degree, technically in veterinary medicine, but essentially in ethology with Roth and Bueller at Ohio State. So while I was doing that, teaching as an unpaid research assistant and rather uh, a graduate student for his class, but it was wonderful. Uh, so while I was doing that, he said, there's two people you should meet here on campus, Heather Saul and Tuber, and they're starting to use uh, treating behavior problems in animals. And I think we might be interested in meeting them. So I did. And they had, they were both psychologists, one an operant person, Tyler Saul and Tuber, who was a dyed in the wool classical conditioning um, student. And they were seeing a couple cases at the Ohio State University Veterinary Clinic. And I joined forces with them for a while. And we started applying these basic psychology principles of learning, either operant or classical conditioning to things. And David Tuber was really the, the biggest pioneer in this. And it was fascinating, the stuff that we did and we were able to treat behaviors that were not traditionally addressed by dog trainers. So we, they was thunderstorm phobias, separation anxiety, apprehension and fear, as opposed to just threatening the animal to try to make them stop doing something. And it worked well. And it was, it was really a, amazing. So that's how I started with this. And then I joined forces with Heather Soul and Tuber for a couple years. And we saw cases for a little while at Ohio State University. And then it wasn't too easy seeing them there because we didn't really have a space that was conducive to treating behavior problems and being comfortable, having the clients be comfortable and things. So a, an apartment was rented near campus and the entire living room of the apartment was converted into a office and a place where we saw behavior cases. So when people came in, we had coffee and people could sit down and relax and we could interview them and uh, try to decide, decipher what was going on with the, uh, the, the pets. So in, in an effort to try to get clients so we could get more cases and learn more things, because it was really, not very many people were coming to see us. I mean, weeks would go by. 
so mostly what David Tuber and I did was study. <laughs> so he was working on his PhD in psych. And I, by this time, I think I had now started on a master's program in, in psych at, at Ohio State. So we spent most of our time studying. And David was an incredible tutor because I had very little background in psychology when I embarked on graduate school in psychology. And I clearly remembered opening the first paper we were supposed to review for an evening class at Barbara Scorla. And I'm reading it and I'm thinking, I don't understand the first word in this paper. So David would take me and we would go over line by line what all these things meant. And it was wonderful. And I really snowed the other graduate students when I got to give my paper, but um, it was uh, it due to a lot of good tutoring. Anyway, I, uh, people were very skeptical when they did come to see us at our, at our facility there in the apartment. They were worried they were being psychoanalyzed. So it was actually very helpful to be a veterinarian as part of this group because veterinarians are trusted, trusted and they're not scary. But the people were very nervous when they'd come in with their dog and they say, I know you're psychoanalyzing us, aren't you? You're really psychoanalyzing us, aren't you? And that was what they thought. But of course, as they relaxed and they began to realize we were just focusing on the animal. But people were afraid to come. So this is a, a little jump forward. For, so for a while, I started asking people if they had told anybody they were coming to see a behaviorist or a psychologist for an animal behavior problem. And most people said no. And one woman said, well, I told my mother. And I said, well, what did she say? And the woman said, she said, don't tell anyone. So they were that afraid that they were being psychoanalyzed and it was all their fault and it wasn't just the behavior of the animal that was the focus of the attention. And these turn out to be species typical behaviors animals exhibit. Owners may not know how to cope with them, but they didn't necessarily cause, well, because they didn't know how to deal with it, it would, it would possibly get developed, but they didn't make the animal become this way. They, they just didn't know how to deal with it and recognize with what was happening. So what, so what was the sort of temperature like then? Because obviously people have had problems with their pets since they've been having pets. I mean, did they just think they had to live with it? Did they just think, well, it's a train, I need a trainer to sort it out? Or, I mean, how, how did you sort of persuade them that there is actually a, you know, there's, there's a professional service here? Well, prior to when we got involved in this, people just even referred to dog trainers. And that was the standard of care. And most veterinarians didn't really offer any advice other than to control the dog, send it to dog training school, etc. cetera. Uh, but while I was trying to drum up some clients for us so we could see, see more cases, I would go to the veterinary meetings that were occurring in the, in the, in the area, at, in, the, in Ohio their monthly meetings, et cetera, and talk to them about what we were doing and things. And they said, oh yeah, oh yeah, I heard about you guys. You're the ones who treat the crazy people. The people. So even the veterinarians <laughs> thought that if a dog had a behavior problem, it was really the owner. And uh, no, they weren't crazy. They were distraught with, with their pet, but they weren't crazy. And a lot of times veterinarians didn't believe what the animal owners were telling them about their pets, but owners are excellent observers of their animals' behaviors. They're not very good interpreters often as to what it means, but most owners that are, love their animals and live with them are very good observers. And once you start just asking about the behaviors of the animal, they sort of get into the groove and start talking about the behaviors. And uh, so it took, it took several years before it became somewhat acceptable to refer a dog or a cat to a behaviorist. Yeah, I mean, even now there are people who are very skeptical about it. One of the things that really strikes me about the early work, and I, I gave you a, a very garbled introduction, I should have given you a, a fuller introduction because as I said, you are one of the pioneers out there and as I said I've already done chats with people like Ian Dunbar and I know that Ian was heavily influenced by your work but the thing that one of the things that really strikes me when I look at some of the early papers is just how methodical you were. Um, now there's an obscure publication by David Tuber and I think it sort of epitomizes what you're saying it, it's in a, 
a book called Psychopathology in Animals. And in that uh, chapter, he describes the desensitization of dogs to noise fears, um, mm -hmm. also separation anxiety. And he produces graphs of this is what is happening each, each section. And actually, I, I printed one out here um, and I will just hold it up to, to the camera just for the sake of people can see just how methodical he was. And I, I'll probably do a PDF and shove it onto the um, talk afters. But each of these oh, that are different. would be great because that's a great article. I, so I wasn't a, even familiar with it till you sent it to yeah. me. I'm so familiar the, with how Tuber approached things. But you know, these are different sessions. So this is how, and this is the, the down here is the lowest volume. These are the volumes as they go up and whatever. And it is just, um, it's just, you know, we seem to lose that for a long period of time. Now you've got a sort of second advent of people, um, you know, um, like Clive Wynn, who I, I know very well, um, and, um, you know, Friedman and the like, who are advocating very much, you know, applied behavioral analysis. And I'm thinking, yeah, you're, you're the second wave. And, and, you know, they're starting to publish papers where they're doing similar documentation. And mm -hmm. it's, it's strange because, you know, I, I know when I, I spoke to um, Clive about this, he wasn't aware of this publication and he published some stuff on, you know, um, documenting the incremental changes that are widely used in applied behavioral analysis. And I said, well, you know, that, you know, David Schuber was doing this back in the seventies. And so I sent him a, a copy of that. And, you know, the, the stuff you were doing, it's almost, it, it's almost as if sort of, it's become so mainstream that people have forgotten who, who did it originally. Mm -hmm. I, I just wonder, if, you know, <laughs> Is that is it very satisfying to think that you know what you've done has become so mainstream, or is it frustrating to think because you're still in academia, which um, um, and you know people aren't citing your work and the early work. They, they, I mean, I occasionally get comments from referees saying, "Can I cite a more recent uh, paper?" And I'm thinking, "No, this is the original people, and I think you should give credit where the original people were done." I just wonder how you feel like that because. As I said that the series of articles in the uh, from the compendium um, and in the vet clinics of North America really were the first sort of coherent body of this is how it works. This is what you need to do. Um, how do you? I mean, well, you... it's sort of frustrating not to be cited because when you're doing the work and putting all the work into developing these things and experimenting with them and coming up with ideas you're not really thinking about being cited. You're doing it because it's exciting and it's fun and you're creating something. It's sort of like if you wrote a song. You're not thinking about somebody stealing the song or, or adapting it to something else. You just did it because it was fun to create it. But then it, again, it's a little bit like after you wrote a song. If somebody else takes it and never recognizes that you helped develop this or wrote it first, then you sort of think, hmm, that's not fair. That's sort of disappointing. So it's sort of like that because you're creating something and then, and then um, you're not cited or recognized for having helped create it or create it. That's, that's the thing. I mean, as I said, it was a bit garbled, my introduction, and I didn't tell some, say some of the things that I wanted to. But it, yeah, I know when I've mentioned to, your name to students, you know, it's not it, for some of them, you know, it, I, I mentioned these names because I, I, I know you and I, I know the other people and I sort of drop names in, not, not to sort of name drop, but just because I know these people and, you know, these are the people that were doing it. And I think it's important we understand where ideas have come from. And yeah, there doesn't seem to be that level of recognize. And I think that's one of the reasons why I also wanted to do these podcasts because I'm thinking, well, you know, we've, the, the pioneers, a lot of them are, are, are still around. And it's, I think it's important that people a, you get to hear about their work and some of the challenges that they they faced, but also, uh, yeah, you know, credit should be given where credit is due. I mean, I know that the story, and it's it's in the beginning of the um, compendium there about the paper that you wrote um, on um, is it animal clinical psychology and modest proposal, or right. in the clinical yeah. animal behavior and modest proposal. And you tell there the story that you submitted the paper for publication and you never heard anything for a year. 
And if it wasn't for the professor at Ohio who happened to know the editor of the journal, but you know, that paper would have been completely lost. I'll let you tell the story because I mean, I've only, I only know the story from um, the compendium here, but I think it's a fascinating yeah. story. Well, it was submitted and um, we didn't hear anything about it for months and months and months. Maybe a year was a stretch, but it was close. <laughs> and finally, uh, the uh, head of the, one of the, one of the prom uh, predominant uh, psychologists at Ohio State in the psych department called the editor and said, what's happening to this paper that was submitted, blah, blah, blah. And the editor says, oh, we never sent it out for review. We thought it was a joke. So then he sent it out for review and it got published. But yeah, it was just set aside. 